What's going on, party people? Welcome to episode 10 of the Culture 316 podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jordan Nahisi. And it's your girl, Edges Divorce. Throat goat. <laughs> Edges. Nah, we need to start the unblock Mo agenda right here on this show. We're starting that She's agenda never right now. Me. Unblock Mo. Her foot down. <laughs> she was like, I am sick of this. I'm not taking it anymore. And then she broke a chair and then threw it in the woods in the middle of North Carolina. But anywho. Listen, um, I know I won. I know I won. <laughs> All right, take that, Bev. But go on, Jordan. Let's go but thank the show. you, thank you guys so much for joining the podcast. If you're listening on YouTube or anywhere, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, thank you so much for joining joining us. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe. If you're on one of the podcast platforms, be sure to give us a five stars, rate us, because that is how this show uh, gets new life and gets new. Uh, fans and new audiences and we're very very appreciative of y'all support so real quick before we get into the show there's three things i wanted to talk about number one uh rest in peace coolio uh it was reported yesterday that he had passed away in his los angeles home he was 59 years old um so we wanted to send our thoughts prayers and condolences to his friends families and loved ones uh on a lighter note number two my yankees all right Won the AL East. All right. You see what we doing. You see this hat. All right. I'm taking off the taking off the headphones for this. All right. I purposely <laughs> put on my Yankees fitted today. Now let me put my headphones back on because I'm a dunce and didn't think this through. <laughs> but yes, the Yankees, we won the we 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 got the AL East. My guy Aaron Judge has 61 homers, which is he's tied. Uh, for the most homers in the American League in a season. So shout out to Aaron Judge. But my Yankees is in the playoffs, which means that it's free smoke for everybody, including the Mets. Even though I love New York, I'm a Yankees fan first. So, and then moving on from that, I wanted to give a shout out to two of my favorite people in the entire world. Our former co-host, the OG icon, Angelo Carter, as well as the current host, the Rookie of the Year, Mo. Uh, they both had birthdays this past week and I had to send my birthday love twins actually, right? Y'all a birthday. It's crazy how the hosts are literal birthday <laughs> twins, but, um, just wanted to come on here and, and show my love to both of my favorite people. You know that I love you guys Aww, dearly and you. y'all better Easy. y'all better. All right. Send money to that cash app, my girl Mo's cash app, as well as Angelo's cash app and show them all the birthday love. But without further ado, this one's going to be alley oop right to you because I know you got a lot to say. We're going to be talking about what happened last night on Dynamite. Uh, Soraya uh, made her debut at AEW Dynamite Grand Slam in New York City last week. And this week they were in Philadelphia. And this is Soraya's first time on an AEW microphone. Um... But it's a controversial segment, to say the least. But I wanted your thoughts and impressions on this, Mo, because when I saw this, I was like, I know Mo's going to raise hell over this. And I just wanted to know your impressions and thoughts, because I have my own, but yours are are more important at the current moment. So, Oh, my God. First of all, I I didn't watch the show last night. I only (laughs) looked up this segment because y'all would not stop asking me oh, what's your take on this? I'm like, I didn't watch the show. I'm like, how bad is it? I didn't even go on Twitter yet. I want to have a fresh opinion on this, mm. all right? I don't, I don't like my, my opinion to be tainted. I'm watching it. Paige comes out, and, I mean, she's she she's a little rusty on the mic. It's, it's expected that she's going to be a little rusty on the mic. Um, I wasn't upset with anything in the beginning, but then she awkwardly bought out the entire women's division after this whole promo about... Um, almost like acting like she's like the leader of this whole women's revolution. It's like, you did that over there in WWE. Don't know what the fuck that got shit to do over here, bitch. Mm -hmm. Like you just came in and then she's telling the AEW locker room to come out, which it was a total of like what? Five people behind her. (laughs) Now five people, including Tony. I'm thinking to myself, why is Tony moving on this newbies time? Like, why is she jumping when Paige says to jump? That right. was a problem to me immediately. I'm like, why is she reporting to her? If anything, Tony should be the one introducing Paige, if, if that was the case. But as the segment continued, she's over here talking about Tony, like she's the GM. 
And she hired her personally. <laughs> and then she got, crowned her as champion. I'm thinking to myself, God fucking damn it. She just sat there and went in about how she's being utilized properly. And homegirl got the belt on her and she can't even get a mic. <laughs> she can't even speak for herself. Mm-hmm. But she's utilized properly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then surely enough, because the whole segment was choppy. It was choppy and it was all over the place. The transition sucked. Um, Britt came out with her group of other bitches and surely enough, it went from being a page agenda to a Britt Baker agenda. And I'm just thinking to myself, your champions in this room and I haven't heard her talk. <laughs> she feels the least important. We somehow went from page to Britt, Britt dragging Tony and making it about her and, you know, she, dra- she threw a jab at Paige with- for her neck or whatnot. And then she low-key just twisted it onto how she lost the belt because of Tony. But she, like, for some reason was introducing Tony's match that she was supposed to have with Serena Deeb, which I thought was weird. I'm like, again, why can't the champion just do this on her own? She's having a match with Serena Deeb. Why can't she be out by herself, no Paige, no Britt Baker, no army of other bitches that were just standing there just like they're waiting for the bus or something? Um, Yo, why? <laughs> why, <laughs> you know, couldn't my girl just take the mic and talk for herself and then Serena came out, they had a match. They they just had this whole clusterfuck going on and Paige was trying, trying so hard. I felt so bad for her at some point because I know, again, she hasn't been in the ring for a while, but she was trying her hardest to keep up with Britt and Britt was eating her the fuck up on the mic, bro. Like she was eating her the fuck up <laughs> and I felt bad. Like she she tried compare, comparing her name from, from Britt Baker to, you know, the, the, the word I can't say on YouTube. And yeah. like the crowd literally just did nothing, nothing. Crickets, crickets, crickets. And then surely enough, as if this segment couldn't get any worse between just all the crossing over just to make it about Brit, a lumberjack match? For what? For what? Right. First of all, half the people that um, Paige brought in weren't even signed yet. I, no one introduced them and said who they are and why they, they specifically came out as a group because they don't represent the whole AEW faction. I'm a faction locker room. Mm-hmm. That was so weird and confusing to me. And I only sat through the match because it's Serena Deeb and Tony. I love them. I just went off last show about how, like, out of that fatal four way, my eyes was stuck on those two. Mm-hmm. But it took away from them. And what bothers me the most about this is that they're so caught up with their favoritism towards. Brand new Soraya, Soraya Page. I'm, I'm going to call her all three names. I'm going to butcher it. I'm going to let y'all know right now. Um, <laughs> and Britt Baker, that once again, you guys are making your top champion, Tony Storm, just feel like she's just there. Like, why does she feel like the least important person out of the whole entire room and she's holding the bell? This is the same problem y'all just had with Thunder Rosa. Mm-hmm. Y'all made other people and prioritized other people over Thunder Rosa. This mm-hmm. came off very diva esque. I felt like yes. I was back in like 2013, especially when they threw in a lumberjack match. I'm like, why? Like, what is the purpose? Like, these two women are so good. They don't need an army of people circling the, the ring. They didn't even do nothing. They didn't, they had no role throughout the whole match, to be honest. They mm-hmm. were just there, just be a prop at that point. So it just annoyed me because it's, it's hard enough to keep the momentum going as a babyface champion. You know, it does help when you have a villain to you know bounce off of but you didn't let homegirl have the mic and you threw her into a lumberjack feud with serena that had to be introduced by brit and it's like where is the layers that are being added to tony storm as a character and a champion that's how you you stay invested in a baby face right you know what i mean we still have to somewhat feel a little bit sorry for you but believing you as being like a fighting champion so it's like who is she battling necessarily with because you literally had serena just come in be a brit she didn't even get to really talk tony gets to talk and the match just happened i was just it was a good match you know, I only watched it because it was those two and I love my girls. But I was just like, what is this? Like, this felt like it had Vince McMahon all over it. It's like, you got Don- Tony Storm, this amazing freaking talent. I adore this woman since the May Young Classic. Like, I love, love, love this girl. And you're already fumbling it. Like, you can't even blame the, the language barrier this time. You cannot. Right. You can't. Because <laughs> Tony Storm speaks clear. She speaks well for herself. And she, she oozes babyface charisma. 
So why don't you just let her be? And put more focus on her. And put her at the top. Put breaks. Britt Baker needs to alternate on, on whatever show she's on. She needs to have like an off week or something. Because she does not need to be interjected every single time. You lost the belt, sweetie. Move to the back of the fucking line. Why are you coming out? <laughs> Why are you coming out? She needs someone else to work with. That's just me. It, it, just, it makes me mad. And... Like, I just applauded Cokehead last week. And yes, you're going to get the name back because you you're got getting lashes, okay? You're getting lashes, Cokehead. <laughs> because what is with you fumbling the woman? Hmm. You invest in Jay Carjo and you're doing perfect with her. Why do you keep disrespecting your top world women's title? Hmm. Answer that for me, Cokehead. Answer that for me. Anyways, go on, Jordan. So there's a couple of things that I noticed about this segment. And... I feel like part of it was just rust, right? Because Soraya hasn't been in the ring for God knows how long. So I expect that there to be some rust on the mic, as you said. I didn't like, to piggyback off of what you were saying, I didn't like this feeling that they were going to build this Britt Baker page feud as the A feud, as the primary feud in the women's division. I thought that the way that they did that very much is giving the way that they did um, the way the WWE had like Rock and Cena as like their main feud and then Jericho and Punk is like their B feud when Jericho and Punk were going for the WWE title. Granted, Rock and Cena were the two biggest names, but I feel like pride and pride alone shouldn't be an incentive. You should be fighting for something. And I believe that when you're challenging each other for a championship opportunity the stakes are that much higher and it only raises the prestige of the championship so i didn't like the fact that it felt like tony storm and serena deeb were taking a back seat to um were taking a back seat to the the primary women's championship um i think that that's like the first thing um, I think the second thing for me was I felt like Soraya was getting bodied on the mic and then she just continued to try to go for the lowest hanging fruit. Um, like when the whole Brit and you know what word rhyming scheme didn't work, then she was like, well, you know, now that I'm in a place where the boss actually listens to me and I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> It was so corny. To me, that was corny. It was unnecessary. And it was just like, cats know that like WWE had you on payroll when you weren't doing anything because you were recovering from it. You have gone on record and in public to talk about how well WWE has treated you. So why even bring that up? Even if it's an in-character promo, like that has nothing to do with this at all. And I just thought it was just overall corny. It was very, very cringe. I don't think that it did anything uh, for the company. I don't think that it did anything for the women's division. And I think that <laughs> they just need to rethink this, this whole thing. I, and once again, to kind of go off the Brit thing that I love that you mentioned, Britt Baker is very much giving AEW Charlotte. Like, somehow, some way, always in the spotlight, and, you know, I feel like she is a credible talent. I think that she's immensely talented. I think that, you know, she, t to be honest, to date, she's probably been their best women's champion. I'll give her that. She's been their best women's champion. She's cut solid promos. She's cut solid matches. But it's like, I, I, I also just think that you can't slander another company for what they do and then essentially employ the same practices on your company with just a different name you can't you know yeah it, that was just my whole thing with it it was just a very weird segment i didn't like the direction they were going in unless this is going to lead to a blood and guts match with Paige, tony athena um and you know versus jamie Britt. Um, and Serena and whomever else, I, I don't see the point in it. I don't see the purpose in it. Um, but 
going from that and moving on, speaking of AEW, something that they are doing really, really well. Um, September is considered National Suicide Prevention Month, and in light of that, All Elite Wrestling has collaborated with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention to produce these short, uh, short-form short segments featuring the likes of powerhouse Will Hobbs and Eddie Kingston uh, to talk about the stigma surrounding mental health. I don't know if you've seen these these segments or these vignettes, but I just wanted to ask you, how important is it that wrestlers, and more specifically wrestlers of color, are talking about mental health issues and, and, and you know, removing the stigmas from them, especially in the world of professional wrestling? Um, I love that that is a thing. It should have been a thing from the jump. I just find it just the timing a little hypocritical. Um, you said that they use Hobbs and they use Eddie Kingston as the faces. Yeah for it or at least the representatives for it um i just wouldn't have went with hobbs considering big soul literally went on a separate interview about um how her time in the company and the way the talent black talent black women were being treated um impacted her and for the for the reason why she wanted to depart from the company and then you had um your white knight over here hobbs just interjecting himself into um the feud with tony khan and big swole and he immediately defended tony khan and he probably has a different experience with tony khan um or his time in AEW, but he did dismiss the feelings and the experience of what a black woman went through in the company Mm -hmm. so that was a very interesting choice to go with hobbs um i i definitely would have utilized somebody else but Mm -hmm. um Tony Khan does have his it people and he probably just that that's just the representative he wanted to go with. But in terms of like the grander scheme of things, I think it's very important that um, we take um, not not just like black people, but I feel like a, a lot of ethnic cultures in general um, do need to have a higher focus on uh, mental health in the wrestling business because it just always feel like it's skewed towards the white people, like not for nothing. Mm-hmm. Like I noticed this with the Asian community. Um, you know, the Indian wrestlers that we had, had um, in, in, like interviews I listened to, especially, yes, the black community, Latino community. I do feel like, you know, a lot of groups are marginalized and they don't have their feelings or anything um, pertaining to them taken into consideration. So I think that's an amazing move. Um, and I, I hope that if Tony's going to go about this, he stands on it because in previous times, I don't even think it's been a year entirely. I think that incident that I just mentioned was about nine months ago, Mm. you know? So I hope that if he's going to go with this, he stands on this, you know, cause I believe everyone could change and grow, but you know, again, he, he, he really needs to stand on this. If he's going to promote mental health for everyone, especially for the black community. Cause like, like I, I see so many black talent go through it, man. And it's just, it's so sad because it's to a point where, it, you're in a business where you kind of have to kiss ass and deal with the politicking, you know, and bend your own morals and your own beliefs for the s- sake of keeping your job sometimes because mm. they do not care. They do not, they do not care for us. At the end of the day, they're almost like numbers, mm. which is sad. Cause I don't view them as numbers, but you know, in the eyes of a promoter or a boss or whatnot, it's just like, Oh, well, you're not feeling well. Okay, well, if that's your reason why you want to take time off, like, you know, Vince McMahon has done to other talent, you know, they're going to kick you to the curb while you're taking your time off and go plug someone else. And then if the crowd likes them, strap the rocket to them. All right, now you lost your opportunity. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, they deal with a lot of stress. It's a very, it's a sport where you got the pressure on, you know, your body physically. You know, every single time you go in there, you're putting your body at risk for, um, having injury or complications or all those little bumps that you take add up until you know uh, uh, until later on in life to where you start moving funny and shit yeah. it's mentally exhausting because you're constantly having to um deal with deal deal with a space where the crowd dictates basically do you get booked or not <laughs> hmm. you have to force other people to like you and that's hard all right yeah. that's hard to every single day between you showing up to work and then reading on social media what crazy things that people say about you, that has to be mentally exhausting on Mm -hmm. top of just doing your job correctly. 
you know? So I would want that across the whole entire board for everyone's mental health to be taken into consideration. Mm. Um, and cause, and I also think that fans need to take consideration the, um, the feelings of, of talents as well. Cause I do feel like we, we, we put a lot of pressure on them. You know, we are, we're so caught up in wanting to see certain matches and certain views and this person to go to this company, this person to go here that we don't like, we kind of forget that these people are just regular ass people like you and I, mm -hmm. they're just on TV making more money than us doing right. something cool as shit, but they're still regular people. And I do feel like we kind of dehumanize them. So I like that this gives them a platform and they may have an outlet. I don't know how he plans on going about this. If these people have counselors and therapists in the back that they can refer to, you know, um is there something i i don't know how, how their medical insurance works over there mm. but i think it'd be lovely if they have an outlet to go to what do you think i think uh to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying i think that this is very important not just necessarily for the pro wrestlers um because i do agree with everything that you're saying with there as it, as it pertains to like them making sure that they have counselors and then making you know making sure that they feel seen and that they feel heard and that they that they're taking their mental health seriously, um, I just think that the aesthetic and the representation of it is just so powerful, and that's the reason why when we talked about the you know the incident with Big Swole and kind of Powerhouse Hobbs interjecting himself into that, do I agree with what he did? Absolutely not, because I you know I think that he dismissed the valid feelings and experiences of a black woman. Um, however, seeing a a guy that's six four damn near 300 pounds talk about it's okay to cry that's going to mean a lot to the black man watching on tv who may be struggling with coming to terms of his feelings and his emotions the same thing with eddie kingston eddie kingston like do be ready to fight at all times and hearing him talk about mental health issues and telling people to, to push forward and that it gets better that's important and so i think that the representation on screen in that particular moment in time um, is, is, a, is, is a very, very important thing to see as a consumer, as a black man. Um, now, as it pertains to wrestling, like you said, I feel like, you know, these, these wrestlers go through a lot. And I think that we get so caught up in them as performers that we forget that they're people. And I know that it's hard on them mentally, emotionally, and in some places more than others, right? Like you get guys who are in WWE, who are on the road 300 days of the year. And then you have guys who haven't made it to WWE or, or an AEW, and they're just doing stuff on the indies and trying to make ends meet. And then you have guys in AEW um, doing their thing. And you know what I mean? Like, everywhere you look in the wrestling industry, it's going to take a toll on you mentally because every company is a different schedule, and a different schedule is a different grind. Not to mention that, the internet wrestling community is an entirely different monster on its own. And then you have to take into the account the criticism of that and how that weighs heavily on the average performer. Because performers want to do their best for the fans. You understand whether you're a heel or a baby face, you know, if you're in this sport and you love it, you want to get a reaction out of the crowd. And so I think that this is a very, very important thing. This is a very, very important step. And I think that this is a very, very dope initiative that All Elite Wrestling is doing, and and I want to see more of this. I would love to see more wrestlers come forth with stories, uh, more black wrestlers, um, more black women come forward with this. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next. Now, speaking, speaking of representation, uh, one of the things that I kind of skipped over in the last show was that because the Acclaimed won the AEW World Tag Team Championships, that makes Anthony Bowens the first gay champion in the company's history. And I wanted to know what your impressions and thoughts about this were. You know, it's weird. Um, like, when I watch wrestling and I'm fully aware of everyone's, like, you know, sexual orientation... I'm not thinking about that, you know, mm. as as a viewer, you know what I mean? And especially with the way he carries himself. Like, I know he has a gimmick that's very playful and it does kind of give you a bit of those undertones, but he's not so, like, forward with it. And I don't, mm -hmm. like, really think about it. And it didn't register until you actually mentioned it. And it's, like, it's pretty fucking awesome because I know that right. there's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of fans out there that are part of the LGBT um, plus community. And it does feel good to, you know, see a little bit of representation um, being shown. It's just like, like I said, like he does his job so well. And I like how um, with AEW, they don't necessarily make his orientation, his entire personality. That. That I feel like is so important. Because I don't like it when companies make their agendas like so prominent. Like WWE has a habit of doing that for some reason, um, especially when they were doing their pride um, thing over the, the summer. Um, it, it came off just like you only momentarily care, you know, like Sonya Deville is probably employed just because they want to say they have a gay female wrestler. You know what I mean? Now that she's bad at her job, she's great at her job and everything. It's just that it just comes off like very agenda as because mm-hmm. i feel like the only time they mention anything about sonya is that hey we have a gay employee y'all <laughs> she's gay and gay lesbian it's the point you like this like <laughs> you know what i mean right but what i like about what what anthony bowens um is that like it's it's implied, but it's not the entirety of his character. He has so many layers, you know what I mean? So I, I noticed that he's like universally love across the board. I know many straight men that are huge fans of the acclaim, not just Max Caster, but the both of them. The, the straights love him, the, um, the gays, the bi's, the in-betweeners. Everyone loves the acclaim, you know? And I feel like they're perfect. They're, they're, they're like the probably the most perfect team you want to go with if you want to have um someone who's going to again like start a precedent of some sort of introducing champions that you know are on different spectrums of sexuality so Mm -hmm. i i know that meant a lot to him you know to have been chosen to been put in that position because it could have been anyone right you know and i'm pretty sure he's been turned away because i know i know um pro wrestlers that been turned away from promotions just because of their sexual orientation but now on lie tv we have somebody who is Representing them, you know, when they hold that belt, it's not just for them. It's not just for the AEW crest, for every other pro wrestler that was turned away or felt ashamed or could have been public about their sexuality, you know, because a lot of people just made it seem as if, like, it's not normal, it's not okay, you know, you got to hide yourself. It kind of just reminds people that it's okay to just be you, like, be unapologetically you. You can get yourself anywhere if you just work hard, you know? Like, we all believe the same at the end of the day, no matter what who you love and who you are, you know? Right. I, How do you feel about it? I 100% agree with you. I, I think that, you know, to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying as far as, you know, there are wrestling companies that feel a little bit performative as it pertains to their advocacy for the LGBTQ plus community. I missed about three letters. But... um <laughs> But for that community, I feel like the advocacy can come come across as a little bit performative. And I feel like, one, the reason why Anthony Bowen's win is so successful, or, or I should say significant, is to him, I believe that he made, he put out a tweet saying, you know, he told his mother that he was going to be successful, and now he he has been able to do it. I think that that's very, very important on a personal standpoint, and I think that that's very, very dope. I think that number two, you know that the fact that his sexuality is not his whole gimmick or his whole character or his whole personality i think that's very important because i think that is very it it goes to show you that gay is not a monolith and i feel like you know even even with the way that you know if you look at wwe you look at nxt you look at quincy and he's kind of like their first i think him and gold desk were like the ones that kind of kind of embody this lgbtq plus flamboyant persona and you know there are people that are like that out there but I feel like it's very very important to kind of showcase that that's not all people that identify as gay you know what I mean and I I feel like it's not a stereotype exactly it's not a stereotype and it's not a monolith and I feel like Anthony Bowen's showing that hey you can be gay you can move like this and you could scissor me like I feel like that's just so important because it shows that's just one person on the spectrum and it goes to show you that you can be anywhere on the spectrum and you can succeed. So I think that him being the first gay champion uh, is very, very significant. Um, I mean, you know, I will say that all E wrestling has done a, you know, a fairly good job at the diversity, equity, and inclusion compared to other wrestling companies in the past. I feel like they've made the conscious decision to put that at the forefront of their brand and being, 
that being kind of like a highlighted value. And I think that we're seeing that it's a highlighted value um, yeah, we with this win. champion within the first year. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, with Nyla Rose. And now we have like a, a gay champion. I know a lot of people were, were upset with uh, Sonny Kiss's booking for a while because they thought that the reason why he wasn't getting a belt was because he's too flamboyant. He's too hmm. feminine and stuff like that. So I'm not saying Tony did this to hush everybody, but, you know, you cannot you cannot say that in this situation, you know, that he he doesn't care for representation, at hmm. least in terms of um, everyone's identity. Um, right sexually and stuff like that so i i just i do like how he he does even it out across the board with that i do have to applaud him for that he gets no that he doesn't get a lashing another lashing yeah he no get, i'll take one lash back he's <laughs> coquette when he pisses me off y'all he's tony khan when he did a good job he did a good job so <laughs> but speaking of diversity i mean this has just been an AEW loaded show but speaking of diversity uh this is a very very interesting I guess hybrid of things to talk about, but West Side Gun, who is a known wrestling fan, very big in the wrestling community as you know, being a rapper and a wrestling fan. He's from Buffalo. He walked out on the Rolling Loud stage uh, this past week with the AEW World Championship. Um, he also brought out Daniel Garcia, who was the Ring of Honor Pure Champion, and he also brought out the cast of Subway Mania. And if you haven't seen Subway Mania, you're missing out. I need Tim on the show because I met him in person. He's actually a really nice dude. But I wanted to know what your impressions were of the wrestling hip hop crossover. And is it paying dividends in AEW? Hmm. Honestly, it doesn't shock me that they're doing this because, I mean, I think one thing that everyone noticed with AEW when we first started watching was the choice, the choices of, um, theme musics were a lot of trap songs or hip hop songs, rap music, like that, that was new because, you know, we got so accustomed to WWE with their choices of, of either pop or metal or rock. So I'm not very surprised that, you know, that we're, we're going at this pace and we're specifically like introducing um, people who are talented in hip hop or rappers or whatever. Um, so I, I think it's kind of cool. I think it's interesting um i would like to see more crossovers maybe we could get a live performance with um one of them we've been waiting for that you know in wwe with cardi b and stuff like that and they kind of for some reason you know just haven't pulled the trigger for what reason i don't know because right. the lady has been vocal on twitter about wanting to right. but um i would love if they if they you know they introduce that more because it kind of gives me the nostalgia from when i was a kid and i was um watching uh jagged edge perform for teddy long's wedding again. yeah or uh three six, three, six mafia, mafia performing for for mark henry or when john cena uh, live performed his his um his uh theme song you know like wrestling fans love that and ate that shit up and i don't know why it went away because hip-hop culture is never gonna die it's not yeah. it's not you know i feel like it's a smart business move and I think it's pretty cool that they bought back some OGs. I mean, we even saw Fabulous. Like, you saw right. my boy Fabulous. Right. You know? I did not think that they were going to bring out Trina, bro. I did not think they were going to. But if we could get, like, some of that, that I think would be great. You know? I, I, I like that because to me as a fan watching, um, especially a woman of color, I do feel like when I'm watching it, it's just like, okay, like, he is also appealing to my demographic. You know, because it does feel like when it comes to WWE, not that, you know, rock and metal music is just for white people. Guy listens to that shit too, right? I listen to basically everything. But it is nice because it does feel like, you know, he does want to appeal to all of our demographics. And he, he does have a certain age range that he's trying to go for. It's very obvious. But I mm -hmm. like the choices that he's going for because he went with some OGs, you know? And Absolutely, he has went yeah. and he's going with. Yeah, and he's going with some current artists. Like I like I like the spectrum that he's going with. So again, kudos to you, Tony Khan. <laughs> okay. I, I I was gonna say, I think that this is a lesson for pro wrestling, not just AEW, but for all of wrestling. Lean into hip hop culture. End of sentence. End of sentence. Like I, I think that the reason why they haven't put on Cardi is because I think that when the interest of Cardi first coming to WWE was like a thing, Vince was in charge and it was a PG product and they were a little bit, a little bit tighter on the restrictions as far as what was on air. And we know Cardi and we love Cardi for who she is. 
Um, however, um, as it pertains to AEW, I feel like they're thriving as as far as their cross kind of their 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 hybrids of wrestling and hip hop because I feel like Cardi B appeals to a certain audience. I feel like Fab and DJ Who Kid, they appeal to a certain audience. Like there's certain cats who just know about Fab and DJ Who Kid. And 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 so like seeing that, seeing Action Bronson coming out with Hook performing the theme song on Rampage was fire. And then Trina coming out and and you know, linking up with Jade. I think that that was dope and that was fire. And like if you know about Trina, you know about Trina. If you know about Action Bronson, you know about Action Bronson. And I feel like you know, the West Side Gun. I think that he was he performed uh Daniel Garcia's theme song when they did the show in Buffalo when Daniel Garcia won the pure title. So this wasn't his first appearance in AEW. Um, I think that him bringing the world title and bringing wrestling slash hip hop culture to Rolling Loud is a very, very big deal. Rolling Loud is kind of evolving into kind of like the hip hop Coachella. And I think that being able to put wrestling, pro wrestling culture on that stage with the faces that he put out there showed that pro wrestling is is for everyone. It's for everyone. And and I feel like even with black people, like with Africa with people of African descent, I feel like there is kind of a stigma around wrestling that is it's kind of like this childish thing, but the fact that you can like successfully bring it into adulthood, integrate it into your life and it not be like super corny or weird. I think it's just a very, very important visual to see. And West Side Gun ain't exactly the worst rapper. That, that dude is serious. He can rap his behind off. So like, I just think that this, this relationship between AEW and hip hop is definitely paying dividends. I think that it should be a lesson to wrestling that, they all need to just lean into hip hop culture. Like, I don't care what wrestling Twitter said. I remember there was one time on wrestling Twitter, somebody was talking about who's Bad Bunny as if that was supposed to be a stab at Bad Bunny. Like, dog, if you don't know who Bad Bunny is, that's more of a reflection on you than it is on Bad Bunny, considering this man is doing stadium tours and selling out. Um, So it's just like, I think that this is just kind of a lesson that uh, pro wrestling as a whole needs to just lean into hip hop culture more. That's how they're going to expand their audience. That's how they're going to get the mainstream exposure that they want, leaning into hip-hop, because hip-hop is mainstream. So yeah. that's all that I had to say about that. I was um, trying to speak about the Bad Bunny thing, because I was like, yeah, when that happened, I noticed it was specifically white men that were about 40-plus <laughs> that was making the Bad Bunny comment. Right. They wanted him to flop so badly, you know, coming out with Booger T., and then this man really shut everybody down when it came down to this first match. I loved it. I just, I love Bad Buddy. Not Shout just out the, to you, Bad Buddy. Not oh. just the match, but the merch. He had oh, yeah. the, the the Royal Rumble exclusive merch. It sold out. Yep. Sold yep. out, I think, after like one or two days. And that was only like the pre-order. So, but yeah, shout outs to Bad Bunny. Shout outs to hip hop culture. Um, Moving on, reports have circulated that WWE has sent out uh multiple feelers to show interest in some of AEW's talent. Uh, these talents include FTR, Keith Lee, William Regal, Samoa Joe, Ruby Soho, and Malachi Black. Um, I wanted to know your impressions on Hunter kind of sending out these feelers. And out of all of these talents that I just mentioned, who is the talent that you would want to see uh, in WWE the most? I have to look back down the name. Oh my god, because I see William Regal and it's mm. like War Games is coming up. It's just like I just want him to come back just to say it. Just, just to, to say War it. Games. <laughs> <laughs> like I need that back because there's no one else I could say. I think last year they tried it with the women and it wasn't it. It wasn't it. All right, I need I need William Regal to do that. But if you're talking about an in ring talent, I um, mm, I think the person that would be most valuable in this moment it would have to be a tie between keith lee samoa joe's great he's fucking great i love him it's just the way they don't use him correctly but keith lee he didn't go out bad necessarily he still he he had like a huge backing 
people that that like was, was like Team Keith Lee, and if anything, his stocks went up being in AEW. Mm-hmm. So I feel like if he hopped over to WWE, it's not like he's a traitor or anything. Like his his, his crowd of people, his fans are going to follow him wherever he goes. Um, but Malachi Black, I would want him to come back out of everyone, mainly because he's super talented. And Vince dropped the ball on him when he got to the main roster. And Tony Khan shockingly dropped the ball on him in AEW. And a lot of people was going to AEW thinking it's the promised land, you know? Like, my boss treated me like shit over here in WWE. They didn't let me be creative. They let me be my my authentic self. You know, they didn't believe in me and see my value. And it just kind of goes to show you that, you know, maybe Tony Khan's not 100% a terrible booker, but... You know, like maybe he just doesn't know how to work with certain people and certain characters and certain elements. And Hunter's good with that. Like, I mean, I could go on and on and on about Hunter's brain. Like, I that needs to be researched and studied, child. But um, the only person that knew what to do with, with Alistair Black is Hunter. Yeah. The only person that allowed him to use his creativity the way he wanted to, but make it just like elaborate to where it kind of perfectly blends um, this mythicalness that he has to him with real life is Hunter. Like, I feel as though he's the one who really deserves it because, I mean, the, his work in NXT was freaking amazing. Um, I went to a House of Glory show that he appeared at, at the end, and I promise you the whole entire freaking room was going crazy for Aleister Black. So he has the backing. Everyone loves him. Everyone believes in him. We're all collectively just frustrated because it's just like, why can't you guys get this guy right? Like, Mm -hmm. it's very hard to mess up Aleister Black. Like, you have this cool behind, tall white man, all tatted up. His look is freaking crazy immaculate. I mean, he had a a move that was crazy protective with the black mask, is kicking people's freaking heads off. Or when he used to just like, yo, he used to pop up randomly just like, you know? Dog, Bruh. that that was like that that at one point that was kind of like the new RKO because yeah! he would pop out and he would just whoop and got and like it was just over. Yes, keep going, keep going, keep going. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, like it just it's so hard to mess him up. And on top of that, like he moves similar to Bray Wyatt, which just like how you don't really need to pump out the ideas for him and tell him what to do with his character. If you kind of just let him go. And go properly and book this correctly and stop trying to just like stitch on all these extra people. That's the problem with all these factions, all these great ideas. They become up with really good, good, good ass ideas, and then they keep adding people and adding layers, and it looks cool for five seconds, but it's like y'all don't know what to do with all this. You just keep adding people and adding fluff, and it's not going anywhere. Hunter's very good with dealing with that. Right. We already went over before how Hunter has been in factions, not been in factions, did his, did a whole singles run, world heavyweight title run, has played uh, backstage as the authority and stuff like that. The man has range, right? Let him deal with his child, okay? Mm. He's the only one. <laughs> Let him come back to daddy, right? He's the <laughs> only one that knows how to book Alistair correctly. Not daddy. Yes, not yes. Daddy. He needs a father figure, all right? And Triple H is it. <laughs> I, I, I think you I feel of, so bad for this man. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You're, you're good. I think you hit the nail right on the head. I'm not going to go out here and disrespect another man and say somebody else is daddy. But <laughs> uh, you do make a point as far as like Hunter knowing kind of his, you know, the people that he has had a very, very strong creative hand in. He kind of knows them very well and has a very, very good creative relationship with them. Hence Bray Wyatt. Hence Aleister Black. And you are right when, you know, Alistair Black was in NXT, I was for sure that this man was going to be a world champion, that this man was not necessarily the successor to Undertaker. I feel like him and I feel like Bray Wyatt and 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 Alistair had the potential to be like the Undertaker and Kane of their generation as far as being WWE's in-ring premier mythical uh mysterious uh, supernatural esque figures, if you will, um, and I think that you know once he went to to AEW, I don't think that he had the, you know, I feel like they ha- took the right steps with the House of Black, um, but you know, I I don't think that he was utilized properly there, and I would love to see him go back to WWE to kind of finish unfinished business and kind of pick up from where he left off because he's in incredible shape. He's in better shape now than he's ever been in his life, and so I think that you know. 
he'll be able to succeed and he'll still he could be able to just kind of pick up from where he left off. The other talent that I would probably want to see back in WWE that's in AEW right now is Ruby Soho. I think that the tag team division, I've said it before, the women's tag team division can benefit greatly from a Liv Morgan, a Ruby Riot reunion. I think that they are a legitimate tag team. I think that Riot Squad was one of the most mishandled factions in the history of WWE. Um, and I feel like they can go back and they could win gold and they could really get over. So I would say that that Ruby, Ruby and Malachi slash Alistair are probably the two talents that I would want to see um, back in AW. But the interesting part about Malachi that I wanted to kind of touch on real quick was that, um, you know, he there were a lot of rumors that he was got his release from All Elite Wrestling, which may be true or not true, but like he said that he had to take a break pertaining to his mental health. And this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the show, right? As far as like people being more concerned. I don't know if you saw the live, but essentially like people were saying he's going to WWE. He left AEW. And then Malachi was just like, y'all, I just need to take a break from wrestling because I need to, you know, work on my mental health. I wanted to know what your impressions of that statement were, if you have any. But I just thought that that was just very important. Um, I'm glad that he spoke up for himself because these fans are so invasive. Like, social media is such a beautiful thing, but it's terrible. Like, it's mm. beautiful in the sense that, like, fans get to connect more directly with their favorite. Like, we didn't have that growing up as children, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, I didn't get to see Trish Stratus and Lita until it was, you know, on Monday, you know? But it's nice that all these other people, and most of, most of the people who use uh, wrestling Twitter are a lot of teenagers or very young adults, you know? Um, and this is the generation that for some reason thinks that they fucking know everything, <laughs> yep. that they're woke and that they know everything and they could be in every celebrity's business. And, you know, like it, to a degree, okay, I understand like fandom, you know, cause I'm part of the fandom too, you know, that's fine, but it's like, you never met these people and you, you're connecting dots that aren't there. And that has to be overwhelming. Right. That has to be super duper overwhelming. Cause again, they're, they're somewhat obligated to use their social media um as being a wrestler and it's like a lot because you want to connect with your fans you love your fans but it's like sometimes your fans just don't know how to tone it down and does it back off because just like we don't know what goes on behind closed door we only know what goes on in terms of just what we see on tv we don't know if it's something with him personally something happened with him and zelena or whatnot um it could have been something with his family you know it could be old trauma new trauma we don't know that's that man's business and it's right. not we we don't need to ask you know to, to you know like let him just be let him just deal with it on his own i, I feel like the whole if someone just leaves it's like oh they are magically going to the AEW thing like it, it, it it's i understand it to a point of, to, to a degree because it's just like all right you know um, we are still in kind of a midst of a of an AEW WWE war, so I get that people automatically think that. We have seen people jump ships recently. I get yeah. that, but it's just like he kind of already said it before, and then you guys are trying to double down, saying that no, 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 he's going back to Hunter. He's going back to Hunter. Hunter's in control now, and he's going to take all his kids back and stuff like that. And it's just like, chill, <laughs> chill. Again, there are regular people just like you and I that just work a cooler job. <laughs> Yeah, that that. Let, let these people just breathe. <laughs> Damn. Right. Like I I feel so sorry for them. I understand why Sasha Banks is so like um like when it comes to her social media compared to a lot of other wrestlers, why it's just pretty like much just strictly business related. And why she doesn't document things like other wrestlers do because people will take anything. I had I had this conversation with someone just recently. I noticed that she doesn't document what she thinks, her beliefs, anything. Like, she don't document what really goes on in her life. The most you'll see her personal life is her doing her little flexibility, th- uh, her flexibility thing, her dog, um, maybe a workout, or maybe something she's sponsoring. Like, she's very private, and I understand why. Mm. I really do understand why, because a lot of these people will take the smallest freaking thing and either try to cancel you connect dots that aren't even there i mean sasha don't even post mikaze and people use that her not posting mikaze and saying that <laughs> they're divorced they're not together and it's like we don't know what goes on in these people's lives you guys right. just on being on top of them and 
saying all these things just makes their mental health worse. Like, give these people a break. That's all I'm just saying, you know, because we're going to lose that access one day with our behavior. And I don't think people understand that. Like, mm. this is a privilege. Mm. The fact that we have access to social media to speak to all our faves and at them and send them messages and stuff like that, it's a privilege. And, like, when you guys do that, it's it's so overwhelming that some of these wrestlers had to deactivate their accounts for a day. You know what I mean? Or for a week or whatnot. Or have a social media team handle their, their accounts so they could just get away. Like, it's it's a lot to have thousands of people assuming your business. Hmm. Cut the shit, people. Cut the fucking shit. So I'm happens. not even going to say anything else other than that. We're just going to go right into the next topic. Because that mm-hmm. was... T- all that was needed to be said was that. Mm-hmm. But speaking of, well, on a lighter note, I should say, Degeneration X is reuniting in Brooklyn on October 10th at the Barclays Center. This will be the 25th anniversary uh, of them together as a faction. And this will also mark the three-year anniversary since they were inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2019. It is not a coincidence that the the return will be happening at the same arena that they were making uh, their Hall of Fame induction in, which is the Barclays Center. Uh, now, I don't know what's going to happen. I expect some raunchy jokes. I expect some surprises. Something funny is going to happen if, if Sean and Hunter are in the ring. Um, but I wanted to know, how would you rank uh, D-Generation X amongst wrestling's top factions? And if you were to comprise... Uh, a, a, a modern day faction that was DX esque, degeneration s, yeah, degeneration x like, if you will, and you can get wrestlers from any company. Who would those talents be? But starting with the first question, how would you rank them as far as top wrestling factions? They have to be like the greatest of all time, and it's like it's because individually, just the the work that Sean and Triple H has put into this company is just it, it's just untouchable like no one's ever gonna do it like them no one's ever gonna have the range like they did and they were there for like everything (laughs) you know they were the flagship faction they used during wcw versus wwe or whatever like they were there for it all and even though they age and stuff like that it's like a faction that people still reference you know the older generation our generation even people like my nephews when they watch wrestling, they reference them. You know what I mean? Because their their group had a lot of just range between, yeah, the goofiness and the perverted and stuff like that. They entertained the hell out of you when it came into their in ring stuff. But um, no one's gonna do it like a Sean and a Triple H. You know, I feel like there are other factions that yes, I do feel like built this company up. But this is the one where it's just like. It's a stick where you probably, like, if you said it out loud to a random person what they do, you would think that, all right, this is probably, like, something that's going to die off in, like, a short amount of time. But they literally made that stretch out for all these years. Like, no one's ever going to turn down a DX reunion because it's just so nostalgic. And it was always with the times. That's what I loved with, with Sean and Triple H. It was a It was a faction where I love how they were able to um navigate whether it was pg or not like they were still able to make us laugh extremely hard like their duo was just so funny it was like a like a beavis and, and butthead almost like relationship that they had and then of course you know back then it was it was larger and we had people like china and xbox and all that stuff like that but i just feel like they are the most impactful um faction and i just wouldn't want to replicate them because i don't think anyone's ever going to do them as much justice as a sean or a triple h there are people who remind me of them briefly but it's just like why would you even want to like recreate that you know it's like let that be its own thing i mean if you guys want to like pay a little bit of homage that's nice but it's just like y'all are never going to especially with the way this generation is and the way that society is lined up and how you can't say certain things and get away with certain jokes there's no way you're gonna be able to replicate a dx like Mm -hmm. it's just not gonna happen what do you think? I agree with you 1,000%. Uh, I think that D-Generation X belongs up there as far as the past 25 years as the most influential influential faction. A lot of people say it's the NWO, and you can make a case for that. Um, but if we're talking about raunchy, rule-breaking, rebellious, 
DX is the standard because while NWO was was doing it, DX made it cool. DX made it fun. DX like made it like they they I don't even know the words to describe it, but D Generation X made the rebellion look fun. And then on top of that, I feel like when we talk about a DX reunion, I think that we need to keep in mind that it is in 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 root with the times. And any time this faction has been able to reunite at whatever point in history, it's never felt out of place. Like we talk about what they did in 97 coming together and then their new iteration in 98 when Sean left and then a new iteration in the 99 and 2000 when it was like them being tied to the McMahons. And then when they came back in 06 to go against the McMahons and Sean and Hunter were a tag team, it never felt out of place. DX has been the only or probably one of the only factions where they have been able to reform, reunite and adapt to whatever the current wrestling climate was. And it worked there. There was a point in time where like, you know, Shawn Michaels is a born again Christian. Right. And there were there were things that they were doing in the 06 reunion, like where Hunter would be the one to take the charge of the rebellion and Shawn would have to like dip off a frame. But you never thought of it as out of place. It was like, okay, this works. This works. This still works. So I think that uh, Sean and and I think that DX is definitely one of the most, if not the the most influential faction of all time. And 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 we don't even take into account the individual body of works that all of these wrestlers have composed of. When we talk about China, first ever woman to hold the IC title as well as a former women's champion, God rest her soul. We talk about the New Age Outlaws, who are one of the most decorated tag team champions of all time. We talk about Pac, and then we talk about even Billy individually, because at one point he was going for a push. We talk about those guys individually, and then and then Hunter, and then Sean as individuals. Like, the individual resumes are Hall of Fame careers all on their own. And then together, it just it's just so much more iconic. And I kind of align with you in the sense of like, well, I don't think that they should have like another, there shouldn't be another DX. But there are certain wrestlers that remind me of what was happening in DX in their prime. Rhea Ripley reminds me of China a lot, especially yeah. in this era where of her being in Judgment Day and whatever may have you. Rhea reminds me of China a lot. Um, the acclaimed are modern day New Age outlaws to me. They remind me of the raunchiness and the silliness that the New Age outlaws have, and they do it kind of in That's their own silly. way. I don't know who's a Hunter or a Sean or an X Pac, but those wrestlers in particular definitely give me DX vibes. But I'm very much looking forward to this D Generation X. Reunion on October 10th on Monday Night Raw. And of course, it's happening where? In Brooklyn, which I'm more excited about than anything. But moving on to the last topic of the show, Ringside News has reported, as well as other multiple sources, have reported that Brock Lesnar is booked for Crown Jewel in Saudi Arabia on November 5th. Now, uh, anytime we've seen Brock over the past couple of years, he's been challenging for the WWE Undisputed universal heavyweight championship however with roman reigns and logan paul set to battle for that title how would you book brock how would you book brock in this show and what match would you put him in well that's a hard one it's actually a really really hard one i would like to see him i mean, i would like to see him with either or extreme i do like to see him with um when he i do like to see him when he wrestles with larger people I do like to see him fling around small folk, but but the pettiness in me wants him to go up against Kofi because I'm still not over it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not over that five second squash. That was disgusting and terrible. <laughs> Disrespectful and no one referenced. And I understand that it was like a Fox decision and all that stuff, but like the pettiness in me is just like, all right, can we have a real match? Like even if Kofi were to lose, can I have a real match? Because you don't just sit there and give this man. This iconic WrestleMania moment and then have the have him, you know, have these great matches that he's putting on and just to have it all just dismantled and forgotten about because of a five second. I don't even think it was five seconds. 
it was like maybe like three and a half right long match that he had that was a squash so i mean the pettiness in me wants him to do that and just he doesn't have to one up him. I mean, I would prefer if he did, but knowing right. how they work, they're not going to. They're not going to, to let Brock. that happen. There's no one really in, that I think in mind that I want Brock to work with at this moment. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I, I maybe you could pair him in. Not not necessarily a faction, but a duo, because Brock mm. has shown that he actually has a personality, which I I wasn't fully aware of <laughs> until he kind of put on this plaid shirt and got the man bun out and he's he's funny he's actually really entertaining so if i wanted if he wanted to just pair it with somebody else and give me that same vibe he had with kurt angle back in those days i would like oh, that yeah, i think that'd be cool but imagine me and man outside of that i i don't really think i got one do you oh i have one and it's an easy decision it's gonna blow um, my mind again y'all third time brock lesnar brock lesnar versus bobby lashley for the u.s title Oh, yeah. Wow, I forgot about that. I think either Brock versus Bobby or Brock versus Gunter. Brock versus Walter for the IC title. I think that he can have either of those two matches because if the idea is is to build the prestige of the Intercontinental or the United States Championship, I feel like Brock, a match with Brock, automatically elevates it. Because Brock has only been, number one, Brock has never held the Intercontinental or the U.S. Championship. So they could easily say, this is, these are the championships that I've never won in my career and I've done it all. Or he can just say, like, I want the biggest dog out here and I want Gunther and I, or I want my rematch with Bobby. I feel like either. would be better just because we already saw Bobby. Yeah, we saw the Bobby one, yeah. Yeah. It was twice, right? Yeah, Two or three times. I think okay. no 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 I actually I think it was only once it was only once um but I just think that Bobby versus Gunter or Bobby versus Brock I mean my bad Brock versus Brock Gunter versus or Brock Bobby. versus Bobby would be the obvious choices for me just because they're trying to build the prestige of these championships and I feel like because Brock has been a main event performer for so long a match with him involved even if he loses, would automatically elevate the title. I think that the only challenge is, is Brock going to lose? Is Brock going to take the pin? Especially after he was just held down for a 10 count during a last man standing match. That's the only challenge. However, I think it's believable if Gunther won. I think it won. is. I think it is I think believable if Gunther believable. won. Yeah, because Gunther's a monster. But those are my probably two picks. Brock versus Bobby Lashley, two for the U.S. Championship, or Brock Lesnar versus Gunter for the Intercontinental Championship. I want to know what y'all are thinking, so let us know. But that was the last topic of the show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, We'll see you guys next week, but be sure to once again like, comment, subscribe, do all that needs to be done, and be sure to give this show a share. This is our 10th episode, y'all. It's crazy that it's been 10 episodes already. But thank you guys so much for joining the ride. And we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Bye-bye-bye.